This week on Rockstar Superhero. Man, I have great taste. Let me tell you why. Layla Abdul Rauf is a heavy music legend. Moving to San Francisco a number of years back, Layla has been performing right in the thick of that music scene. The scene I speak of is full of metal artists known for creating works in multiple genres and of the very darkest styles. A few years back, Layla was looking to express herself in a radically new way. She started writing melancholy musical suites that share equal space between splendor and threat. It's truly startling work. Her music shreds every preconceived notion of what a heavy music artist should be creating, and it's proof that the best can do it all. Her latest release, Fantasiae, proves her level of skill. Layla continues to do solo shows where her work shines in new and surprising ways. For those interested in seeing her in the future, Layla will be performing in Seattle at Terror Fest in July of 2022, so make sure you get that on your calendar. Personally, I can't wait to see her live. I should also say that you might want to watch out for some secret shows in the near future as well because, well, things are cooking. So, listen to the whole show today because rest assured, this is worth your time. This is my conversation with Layla Abdul Rauf, the crafter of on and off stage musical experience on the Rockstar Superhero Podcast. It's a really incredible honor to have you today. I like to use the word honor because um, it is. <laughs> and so I want to start with this. Wow, isn't isn't this cool? Isn't this cool that we're together today? Thank you. Wow, that's quite an introduction. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm grateful. And I agree. Uh, wonderful promotion company got us in touch. And um, Dave and Liz are good friends. So uh, yeah. Well, you know, you've you've been in the business a long time. Um, you make no bones about that. You're definitely tried and true. Yeah, you know what you're doing and you know what you want. Um, but I'm curious about, you know, if if we don't, if you don't mind, maybe jump back a few years. But you know, you currently make your home in the Bay Area, if I'm correct. And I'm not asking for your address, but <laughs> have you spent your entire life in that area, or is that somewhere you chose to settle? And if so, what drew you to the particular scene? Uh, I've been in the Bay Area now 18 years. Wow. Yeah. And so I'm an East Coast transplant. Gotcha. And, um, and I ended up in San Francisco um, to form a metal band with a, f a good friend of mine, uh, Tim Scammell, who I uh, went to college with in New Jersey. Yeah. And um, it just circumstances just worked out that uh, I wasn't, I was sort of like drifting between, I was just kind of living out of my car basically for mm -hmm. about a year plus. Yeah. And, um, and just thinking, you know, I was in my late twenties and, and I was like, well, where, where do I want to uh, set my roots? And, and it just worked out, you know, Tim had like a vacant room in his apartment in Haight-Ashbury and wow. the rest was, was kind of history. Yeah. You know, I envy that so much. It's one of those things where, um, you know, I, I know you don't know this about me, but I was a session drummer for a number of years and I always envied having that, that take a risk lifestyle. I didn't quite ever have that in me, right? That fearlessness that I think is required to be a somebody in the business, whether it's a, an alternative somebody or a pop somebody, right? Um, I think it takes massive guts and what you just said, you know, being willing to live out of your car to pursue a dream and, and the hope that all the things will work out is, um, it's the artist's way, you know? There's a, there's a level of crazy in it. It, it was definitely crazy and I was doing music, but it was like, everything was failing. Like it was a very difficult time that mm -hmm. actually I would never want to revisit that period of my life again. But, yeah. but you know, all the, all the stress and pain and sort of like uncertainty, uh, you know, it definitely hardened me to an extent. So 
Yeah. You know, it, it felt like anything that came after that was was relatively easy to do. Right. Well, but you give up so much, right? I mean, people people always think that, well, they wonder, of course, why musicians for the most part don't have working relationships or don't have children or don't have traditional home bases. And they don't think about the fact that our lives are transitory in almost all the ways because we're constantly seeking to fulfill our artist identity, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm, how do I respond to that? I mean, in some ways, my life is just so conventional. Like I have a regular like office job and yeah. I have a second side gig, a uh, writing gig um, for uh, the Rocksmith game. So, so cool. you know, in, in so many ways, I'm just like, <laughs> just have sort of this average life, but um, yeah. but there was a lot of turmoil to get to this point. So yeah, I'm glad that that is over and that um, you know, and you know, and then when I came here, it was like I was really I was doing a lot of rehearsal and really getting myself out there. And over the years, it's sort of like I've been sort of like working more and having less time. Mm -hmm. for creative stuff. So I feel like I need to get my life back to yeah. more creative. That would feel a lot better. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, and, and pardon me, maybe if I didn't quite word my statement, because obviously it wasn't really a question, but I do think about that. I mean, when I meet somebody like you, who's, again, in the middle of it, you might have these traditional jobs um, most people don't understand that of course because they think everybody in even the smallest bit of the public eye is somehow a rock star and they don't need to work a normal job and it's so insane to assume that but that's yeah. what they think right um and it's so opposite yeah it is so opposite we're working two to three or five jobs or you know back in the 80s we were we were working restaurant jobs because we could keep our long hair <laughs> totally. And now I don't even have hair, so it doesn't even apply. Right. Uh, um, was the band, was the, were you referring to Cardinal Worm? Oh, um, the band that um, I formed when I moved to San Francisco uh, was Saros, which was more of like a okay. sort of a proggy, death metal, blackened, thrashy kind of amalgam yeah. Yeah. of all all different subgenres of metal but um but yeah that that was um probably to this day the the tightest band i've ever had where we rehearsed 3 days a week and we were probably playing shows every week there for a while i mean we were around yeah. for 6 years yeah uh but just on a technical level what that band accomplished was like i appreciate so much and it's like I don't know if I'll ever have a band that that works that hard ever yeah. again. So that that was an amazing experience. Yeah, but do you want to work that hard again? You know, there's that there's that too. Do what are you willing to trade for it? Right. 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 Well, I what I traded eventually was to do a lot of different projects in a lot of different genres because my my creative interests just completely exploded. Yeah. Uh, throughout my time in the Bay Area and just, you know, being part of all these different underground scenes. Um, some of them have like nothing to do with each other. So, um, so I really got into that part of it. And then, and then the solo project eventually took shape yeah, over the yeah. past 10 years. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. I mean, I know I kind of said it at the top, but music like yours is so rare you know and 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 what i'm hoping that maybe what we can do today is break down a bit of the intention behind the work right um something that you had said in an interview a while back that you had actually pointed me to in an email was that you believe ambient music can be heavier than traditional you know heavy metal or heavy music um and i want to say that i agree wholeheartedly but do you mind sharing that concept a bit with my audience? Sure. Um, I I think the point, I, I feel like that statement might have been taken a little out of context because I was trying to explain how uh, ambient music is heavy, like mm -hmm. the heavy genres that your average person 
considers to be like, you know, extreme metal and um, sludge or like, you know, right, doom, noise, yeah. doom, that kind of thing. And ambient is heavy and it can be just as oppressive and suffocating as, as any of those genres. And, and that's why you see a lot of overlap between all of those yeah, uh, yeah. genres as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you said this because um, recently I had played some music by another artist that's represented by Earsplit. Um, her name is Plum Green. And my mother, who's still alive and uh, one of my hugest influences, she has an impeccable singing voice. Um, she told me she had to turn it off because the song conjured up too much emotion and darkness and baggage that she's carried since childhood and that the songs made her feel uncomfortable. So I, I totally understand what you're saying, but I think I'm, I admit I'm, I'm drawn to that darkness and it's probably because I've never been happy with sappy, if that makes sense. Um, and I don't want to mock or poo poo um, how she felt about it. But I like that it knocked her about, and I like that your music does the same. Thanks. Yeah, um, there's there are a lot of there's a lot of music out there that it's just very unsettling and uh, uncomfortable, and not everybody uh, wants that feeling when they listen yeah. to something. And I think um, I think everybody. Uh, like me and whoever's in the, in these kind of niche extreme genres, uh, you know, we're used to the fact that, you know, our music isn't for everybody. Um, but the people it does reach, you know, it, it def does hit them in a very deep way. Yeah. And that's to me more satisfying than, you know, the number of people that are actually listening to it. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I'll tell you, I wish that I had discovered you in 1985, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I get it. That's a long time ago, and you probably, you're much too young to have probably been playing yeah, music at that time. Yeah, I was time. like nine, nine years old. I was playing music at nine years <laughs> okay, old. Okay, good, good, yeah. good. But I'll tell you, here was an experience that I had, and listening to your music brought this back for me. Um, in 1985, I had moved to Portland to try to make it in the music business. I know why Portland, but I had my reasons. And the guy I was staying with, sleeping on his couch, he was introducing me to all this material I'd never heard. I'd never heard Kate Bush. I'd never heard Laurie Anderson. I'd never heard Jean-Michel Jarre. Uh, I'd never heard of just so many of these artists, these, these contemporary, thoughtful artists. And I sat in the dark. They taught me how to sit in the dark with headphones on. We'd sit there and drink. Um, wine, you know, some red wine or something, you know, that a college student could afford. And we would listen to these albums in the dark. And it reminded me of something in my childhood that again, I wish I had discovered you or that you were available back then when I was growing up, because when I was little, my mother used to sit me down at a table with the blank paper and crayons, and she would put on Beethoven or Prokofiev or Brahms or, or maybe even Wagner. Um, and say, draw what you see in your mind. And so I've been trained from day one to see music in my mind, to, to visualize it. And I'm 100% positive this is why you and your music resonates with me and other listeners like me, because it's so visual and it creates such a dark tapestry. Um, I'm thrilled to see what's next. It's a horror movie waiting to, you know, uh, pour, spill out of my mind. Um, and again, no question, but I guess maybe what do you think about when somebody says your music is something I want to draw? I want to, you know, I want to create a visual version of, of what I hear. That's music to my ears. I mean, it's really uh, such a, you know, the visual is such a big part of my process and both on record and live. Um, I like to have, uh, visuals projected. Um, most ambient artists do, Yeah, but that, that really, um, you know, sucks you in, in a way, uh, that it wouldn't, if you didn't have this literal atmosphere before you, 
Um, and then it's like that with, with cover art on a record, right? Like you're, mm -hmm. especially like back in the eighties, you know, when that was mostly just vinyl, everyone was listening to maybe a cassette or something, but, Sure. you know, you were staring at the cover art when you were, you know, sitting next to your record player and you know, that, that experience, I mean, I'll never forget those days really. Yeah. Um, so I think just just being part of that generation, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure younger people feel it too, but there's just something about being part of that analog generation where you have that physical connection with the image yeah. and the sound. Yeah. Well, you can't listen to albums on phones, but I don't, I don't understand why anybody does anything on a phone, why they watch movies on a phone or right. I, I mean, outside of listening to music through Bluetooth, um, I don't understand the idea of, of, of saying I can absorb a record when I'm in my car. Um, and granted, this is probably me being an arrogant snob, but I agree a thousand percent. I think having an album or having liner notes or having something in front of you to take you to this place that the artist has created for you is so important. And, you know, I want to be transported to another place or time. I like music that takes me to a place I don't normally reside. I'm not interested in being me at that moment, if that makes sense. Oh, um, absolutely. And I'm curious, when you make this music, do you become someone else or is this you? Huh. Well, both, right? It's me. It's all different sides of me. And I get to pick which one I want to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through the, it's a journey. It's a journey of different selves in a way. You know, That's each true. album is like a snapshot of who I was at that time, and right. it's always changing. Yeah, every you know what they say every seven years we're a new person, but it's it's. I think oh, like literally, your skin sheds. You have yeah. a new yeah. flesh. Yeah. yeah. And yet somehow it only replace, replaces the the previously scarred flesh, right? It's not like it regenerates into new perfect skin. We have the old skin just remade. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, well, you're here to talk about your new album. Um, now, I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. And I know it came out in July, I should say, I believe. Um, is it Fantasia or Fantasia or how, how do I pronounce it? Fantasia. Of, of course. It's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't win today. Oh my goodness. You know what? I don't know the exact th that's just the way I've been pronouncing it, but okay. I I think in different languages people are going to pronounce it in different ways. So sure. it's it's not an English word, it's a Greek word. So yes. um yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, it is <laughs> <laughs> the English equivalent, I guess. Well, you know, I mean, of course, when I when I started to do my lame research, <laughs> I, you know, I looked up the wording, right? And the promotional material, obviously, I mean, the, the word is spelled a, a very particular way. It means a very specific thing. Um, so I actually compared what is, you know, the word fantasy with the PH compared, you know, what's the difference between that and fantasy as though we see it in Western culture, right? With an F. Um, and and it really broke down that it was primarily stylized, but it was also this intention about the subconscious versus conscious thought. And I'm wondering if that applied to you when you named it, when you were creating it, or did you just like the particular spelling and look of the title? I really was drawn to the meaning when I came across that word and it, so I, I'm an office manager at the Psychoanalytic Institute in Northern wow. California. Wow. And so I, I have access to all sorts of intense uh, readings, you know, uh, journal articles and that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and so that word came up and I looked it up and I was like, this is, I really connect with this. Yeah. Um, and I also love the, the look and feel of the word as well. Uh, so between that and sort of uh, having the cover image in my mind, that's that was the beginning of the album. You know, that's 
it sort of was the reverse of my usual process where I just start tracking and see right. where it goes and try to find a common uh, thread among the tracks. Mm. This was sort of like the image and the word came first. And yeah. then my job was to create the songs that that image and word sound like. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you captured it. I, I think it's, uh, it's a very spiritual and evocative piece. Um, and it's great music for, to work with actually. Um, when I've been doing production work this last week, I've been listening to it, just letting it flow. And the piece that seems to stand out, cause it's a, you know, it's a suite of songs, um, is consumption. Um, for me, uh, consumption is just this beautiful piece and I feel it under my skin in a way that the others, um, I mean, they all work. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they're all lovely, but for some reason that the particular theme of that piece, I, I believe that's what it's named, <laughs> uh, really popped out to me. Um, so I'm curious because it's a suite of songs, how 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 does that how does that work? How do you decide what order to piece them together? Did you write them in order? And you know, is there a favorite in there? Yeah, I I love that one. That's one of my favorites as well. Um, cool. I didn't write. I, you know, that suite I might have written in order actually, but there were songs on side two that were written first. Mm. But the whole development of that of those four pieces mm -hmm. um, did happen chronologically. It just, it just felt like, okay, this is, this is the emotion that needs to happen here. And this is the emotion that needs to follow it, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. And that just made sense. And once I, once I had a sense of the um, emotional timbre and movement, um, that's when the, the song titles came to mind. Like nice. this is what's happening yeah. psychically from stage to stage. Yeah. Yeah. Are you open to sharing why you named as an example, why did you name the piece consumption? Why, why did that word pop out of your head? That song just sounded, it just sounded like being slowly eaten alive psychically. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I get out of it too. I mean, if you hadn't have named it consumption, I would have said, I feel like my soul is being eaten by a dark force. Right. Like what if I named it like, I don't know, blue sky or something <laughs> like, would you have had a different, you, you might've felt differently about it. You know, that all these things really work in tandem. Yeah. Right. The title uh, makes you listen to the thing in a certain way that you might, not have otherwise that's true but i think see being a drummer i approach music so differently right because i'm listening to the rhythms i'm listening to the arrangement i'm listening to the pedal tones and the and the dynamics and the way things cross over into themselves and i think if you had named this blue sky I would have listened to it and then I would have laughed because I would have said, Oh, I see you're being, you're, you're, you're being tongue in cheek, right? You're approaching this with a, a jaded eye as though look at the blue sky. It's anything but blue. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of, yeah. I don't know if I have that kind of humor going, probably not, but I, you know, some of the, you know, I, I appreciate that humor when, when yeah. other people have it, it works for them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, but you have a sweet nature. I mean, we're talking here today. You don't have to give me this time and you're putting up with all my stupid questions. So I think, you know, you're probably this, uh, incredibly kind person who, um, writes challenging material because it's, it's not only part of your journey, but, um, it's a great way to, you know, to sort of get the ugliness out of you and at the same time allow somebody like myself and allow yourself to revel in the fact that that seeming ugliness is actually quite lovely. It's really pretty in its darkness. You know? Yeah, absolutely. That was, that's what I was going to say is I'm trying to do both at the same time all the time and I'm trying to do them uh, like I, I think on, on Fantasia, I think 
the ugliness probably came out a little more forward than on previous releases. Yeah. But I'm trying to just kind of do a different balance every time. And uh, but I think they, I think those opposites have to be there yeah. to be really engaged. You have to be, you have to be drawn to something and repulsed by it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And you really, uh, it has your attention. Yeah. That's so true. Um, I find it interesting too. You know, we mentioned a little while back about this idea of the music business being about, you know, pop culture and being celebrity and what, what artists do to create things for others. And, and, you know, as I've listened to this, my, my brain told me, I don't know how much she's made this for others as much as she's made this for herself and hope we enjoy it. Um, is that a fair question to kind of ask? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's, it's increasingly getting more the latter than the former. Yeah. 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 Do you think it's because you know, and maybe don't care that trying to become some, you know, legendary musical artist. Um, it's not that it's not in the cards, but it's really not about that. Because, I mean, like nowadays, like, we, you and I, we we're in a world where we we can create something extraordinary, um, or in, at least in your case, <laughs> and and put it out there and. Who knows how long the internet is going to last, right? Maybe in 200 years, it's not, doesn't exist anymore. But, but I love the idea that there's something out there that's created in perpetuity. You know, I, I was talking with my children the other day and I have no idea what my great grandparents sounded like because they passed away before I was born. But I like the idea that, you know, a hundred years from now, somebody can discover something we've created or this conversation right now and can say, you know, that was a, that's a, an aunt or an uncle or a, you know, right. Somebody in my, in my lineage that made this thing and they can look at a picture and they can see us talk and they can put an identity to our face. It's not just an 1850 photograph of an old man standing on a farm. Right. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. We have the physical thing to, hopefully exist, assuming it doesn't disintegrate over the centuries. Yeah. But yeah. if the internet goes away, it's gone. I mean, everything, everything in the cloud is gone for yeah. good. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 It's all in just somebody's computer. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. We, and then we, we say, Oh, we have redundancies. <laughs> yeah. The power goes out. There ain't no more redundancies, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So, the album has been out since July. Um, because your music is cinematic, and I've been talking to a, a number of cinematic artists lately, um, are you are you working with filmmakers or different visual artists to get your work seen by others, or are you know do you do you self produce everything? Are all the visuals? I can't remember if you said this a moment ago, but you know, are the visuals yours? You know, I, uh, I've always wanted to develop uh, visual artistic talent, but that's something mm. I've never done. So mm. I leave it in the hands of the experts, like my friends. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, it, I uh, perform with, um, with uh, visuals and they are created by someone else, but, but I am very involved with sort of the, the concepts and, or, you know, describing like, th this is, this is the texture. Th these are the colors. These are the movements that, mm. that I'm drawn to. Um, mm. And um, I think, I think it would be great. I think it would fit very well with, with soundtrack work and stuff like that. That's a whole other world that I've never been a part of, but mm -hmm. Um, you know, that, that would be a really very cool thing to, uh, to get connected to. Yeah. But otherwise I just, you know, I'm just doing my thing here. Um, and it's, you know, and I, I still have metal bands that I play with and they're, they're all at different levels of, uh, you know, 
popularity and <laughs> obscurity. So it's sort of <laughs> like when, when you're working in all these different settings, it's like you're not, it sort of takes the pressure off to make something so that it's going to sell or you right. know, people are going to love it and, you know, sing accolades for, you know, years to come. So it's, yeah. that part's gotten a lot less impo important. And I think once you've, you know, you get to your fifth album and you're just like, well, <laughs> if you were, you know, right. but you know, sometimes you, you get a new audience with each record, which I have, but, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then, and then, uh, but you're not, you're not necessarily looking for it every time you, you just kind of, uh, just see what happens. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, it's interesting though, because you brought this up a second ago, which is the idea of creating lots of material and, you know, obviously constantly evolving and hoping audiences get a snapshot or, you know, there's something about what you're doing right now that captures them enough to, to go look at the other things you're doing. But it's, it's so interesting how artists in general, um, and, and I'm not pigeonholing you here. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not pointing at you. I'm really pointing more at myself. But this idea that we keep going and we keep looking for new avenues to express ourselves because we're so, I am anyway, <laughs> so desperate to be heard and to be loved and admired that even though as we get older, we go like, eh. Yeah, it is what it is. Some, most people are going to, you know, they're not going to notice it or they're not going to care, but it's going to get a few. But I'm always secretly searching for the the antidote, right? The the thing that makes me feel like I've done something because. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, don't I, feel that way I at definitely. All. I mean, a, any bit of fan email I get, it just makes my day. I mean, yeah. it really, you know people don't realize when they write to their favorite artists, how much that makes an impact yeah, on yeah. their emotions and <laughs> their abilities to get through the day sometimes. I mean, yeah. it's, it is important. Um, I guess my, my thing is to just try to manage my expectations around uh, each release and, you know, oh, it's not going to be for everybody. You know, some people are going to just worship it and other people are, it's not, you know, they're not going to relate to it at all. And right. you, it's just a part of like an acceptance of that. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, but I, if, uh, for example, look, let's, let's go to Radiohead in 2000. I mean, let's be honest. If that was their first album, if Kid A was their first album, they would never have broken. They absolutely would not have. They had Probably a, not. they had a huge following up until then that honestly was massively disappointed by that album. And yet, 20 years hindsight, we're able to look back and say, wow, look at the balls on that band. Right. right? Um, but I, but I think about music like yours, you know, it, I think it's often um, misunderstood because they're sonic ideas, right. And, and the, and the stories are actually rooted in the tones and and I wonder how how hard that is, or how difficult that is to get somebody to pay attention. How how do you find your audience? You know, they it's really just them finding me for the most part. Um, but you know, it's it's a struggle sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I've been established in the metal world for the past twenty years. Yeah. And that's what people want. You know, they, they see my name. They want death metal. Yes, they do. Yeah. And when they don't get death metal, they're not happy. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, that's why I brought up Cardinal Worm, right? It, 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 it's, it's, uh, there are certain things you just expect from people. And, and, it, and you know, I mean more like Vastum. Vastum's the band I was oh, talking really? about. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't that's, know. That's definitely more my band than Cardinal Worm. But, oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'd always um, seen your name connected to the former. So my apologies if I hopefully that didn't offend you. Uh, not at all. Not a Cardinal Worm's great. Do you feel then? Okay. So now, so this, this is all coming to a head here. I can feel it. Do you feel then with all the avenues you've taken all these, again, sonic ideas you've dropped out into the world. Do you feel there's a bit of, um, 
fight in the sense of like I don't know who if you know who Jurgen Munkeby is from the Norwegian band Shining, but he's well known for basically thumbing his nose at everything that is popular. Co constantly changing it up goes from death metal to pop jazz to techno. I mean, it's just all over the place. And so he, he gains new fans every album and loses the previous fans because they can't stand the new direction. Um, do you feel, do you feel like you're kind of like that? I'm not saying you are, but do you feel like you're the kind of person that says, check this out, look where I'm going next. I dare you to follow me. I don't know. I don't think I'm, I'm that, uh, I don't think I have the super bold, intense okay. persona that, that can just do like, you know, just completely, you know, Screw balls this. out aggressive. Like, yeah. yeah, it's just not me. I'm just a lot more introverted of a person. Um, but you know, maybe in sort of this like <laughs> underhanded way or really like, uh, you know, subdued way. Right. Right. Unintentional yeah. even perhaps. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, Definitely boy. unintentional. <laughs> I mean, the, the subconscious is always at work. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, so, okay. So, so then that leads to Vastum is your baby. Obviously you have this new album out here. What are the next steps? I mean, are you, uh, as an artist, I'm sure you're actively seeking new stories to tell, but you seem so full of this intense, sort of spiritual energy, you know, that needs to be transformed into notes. You know, I mean, it seems your cup is overflowing, right? Um, and I wonder if a person like you will ever have enough time to express all of the things caught inside of you, or do you, or, or maybe are you holding back and you don't think you'll ever get it all out? You know, um, if I ever get to a point where I don't have to work for a living, yeah, there's so much more I could do. But until then, I'm I'm pretty you know time limited. And uh, but yeah, uh, the other thing is like just being a solo artist has really made me autonomous in a way that I never um, something that was something I never uh, had in my life previously and. Mm. Uh, so that autonomy has given, you know, it's made me like this free agent in a way that uh, I get hit up for collaborations on a regular basis. Yeah. And so with that alone, I never know who I'm going to work with from like oh, month to month, year to year. And I, and that allows me to do all different kinds of things. Like, uh, like there's a, there's a electronic industrial duo from Indiana called Harco city that I, I did. Uh, guest vocals like harsh uh, harsh vocals for a few of their songs and and I'm such a huge skinny puppy fan that oh gosh yes it was like you know I, I was listening to them in like the late 80s early yeah. 90s yeah. myself yeah. and I, yeah. I did get to see them live and and it's like that that like you know there's like this inner ogre inside of me and I totally got it out for that collaboration you know and I think that's just like the benefit of you know just going out in my with my own name that people are like oh well we know you do these kind of vocals we know you do all these different instruments like do you want to do this particular instrument for this song yeah and uh, so there's a lot of freedom it's it's really nice yeah and, there, and it's also like it's not too much of a commitment you just work on a couple of tracks and you're done and you can move on to the next thing and you know yeah. and you never know it, i never know who's going to contact me it's really yeah. cool no, man. I mean, I guess to end this today, I mean, I would tell you that, I mean, I'm so blown away by you. I mean, I've honestly had a hard time. I didn't want to embarrass you by asking you silly questions, right? The traditional uh, dumb podcast questions, the, the guy who doesn't know anything. And I love how confident and clear you are. I, I I think I think what makes you amazing and what truly sets you apart is that you know you know how like when you you talk to your friends and they'll say things like well I don't know I mean about their life right in any general way whether it's who they want to be with you know like in a relationship or what they want to pursue people are always holding back from pursuing their dream lives and I mean 
I get that, of course, because, um, you know, we all go through our pursuits. I mean, you and I have artistic pursuits and and the lens we see everything through um, is ours. But we both know so many people that never pursue anything and mostly out of fear. And I get that. But I guess the question to you would be, if if there's any one concept that you'd like to erase <laughs> from public memory, uh, an idea or philosophy that you see that destroys people. What would you What would you take away from all of us so we could live our best lives? Oh, capitalism. I mean, that's why we're all exhausted all the time, and yeah, don't you know? So many of us are lacking our creative drives because we're just trying to survive. Yeah, so it's yeah. like. If we didn't have to worry, if we if we knew we were going to have a roof over our heads and food to eat for the rest of our lives, and everybody was going to take care of each other when we're sick, yeah. um, think about all the possibilities. If you just had your day to do whatever you wanted to do, I mean, yeah. that's that's the dream. Yeah, yeah. I mean, rich people get to have that dream. So, yeah. Okay, so now I'm gonna now I'm gonna pick on that just for a second because I agree with you. But do they? Do rich people? Uh, not necessarily. I, I don't know <laughs> what people have going on. You know, because of, because it's like you always have to worry about your money, where it's going. You know, and, right? Uh, I mean, your your struggle isn't survival. If you're rich, it's it's true. Maybe a, a whole. You know, maybe you're getting sued for like a billion dollars or something like that. I don't know. Or you have some crazy scandal going on in your life, but yeah, yeah. But if you're not trying to survive, like there's a lot of freedom. So much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, I look again. I'll say this. I I know you. You seem to be the type of person that the last thing you want is to have praise heaped on you. But I, I do genuinely enjoy what you've created. Um, it's truly lovely. Um what you're doing is inspiring to me. I love the fact that I can look at you across the board and see you in all these different genres and excelling at that. And I envy the shit out of that <laughs> because I think it's, I think it's an amazing thing. Um, so my promise to you is I, I, as I meet amazing artists, I'm going to start connecting them to you because, you know, I'd love to hear you on more collaborations. I'd love to hear people, working with you in new and exciting ways. Um, because I think somebody like you, Layla, I think, I think, I think you deserve the world, not only to know about you may, and maybe this much of the world, right. But, but people to know about you and celebrate what you've created because it is courageous and you're doing it and there needs to be more like you, you know, I mean, I, I bow down to that man because, um, I know I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry, but well, thank I, you. No, that's such an honor so to hear. Really, yeah, it's it's so good. I mean, you're really extraordinary, and um, you know, I'm going to be listening to your album again tonight, and my daughter is going to be actually drawing to it using my old, uh, you know, experience from when I was a child. So, um, so I thank you it. for I, encouraging. If you wanted my to children. share that with me, I would love love to see. it. I will tell you what, here's what I'll do because she's been asking me and I'm going to leave this in the show because I want people to hear this. Um, my daughter, her name is Cadence um, because I'm a drummer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's an incredible artist. I mean, I get it. She's my kid. She's an incredible artist. She has her own anime style, the whole thing. And she's now doing animations. And she actually asked me two days ago, dad, do you have an album or a song or a piece of music that I could do like a 30 second animation for? And I said, honey, every artist in the world would love some 10 year old kid to make an animation for them because it shows how much you appreciate their work. So I promise you, I will point her towards your material. I'll, I'll have her Excellent. look at, yeah, I'll have her look at consumption. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see what we can come up with, okay? That's so awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fantastic. Thank you for giving me time today. It's really, really badass. My pleasure. Mm. Great to talk to you, Rob. Rob.